Church, as I was uh, preparing a sermon this Sunday and uh, recognized I need to deal with the topic of slavery somewhat, uh, as we have in Scripture the slave-master relationship, and I, I was um, amazed at how uh, God has used his church throughout history to free the oppressed, and uh, reading again about Harriet Beecher Stowe, and you know the book uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, any of you have probably read that, uh, most schools at least used to read that, I'm not sure about any more, um, but as I was studying about her life a little bit, I found that she decided to write that book during a communion service. She was a mother of, I think, seven kids, if I'm correct, seven children, had a lot on her plate, um, and wasn't this huge popular person until this book came out, and in her 40s wrote this book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was because of her awareness of how Christ had set her free from her sin, and then asking God, how can I minister to people today? And how can you use me today to set the oppressed free? She lived in Cincinnati. Yet Kentucky was right there, a slave state. So she was a part of the Underground Railroad and helped people, um, you know, blacks from the South, get free. It's a beautiful picture of someone who had a, a, a really a revelation from the Lord on how she was to live while taking communion. So communion is a, a powerful thing for the church. It's to remind us of the great sacrifice of our Lord Jesus as he gave himself for us on the cross. And so I want to encourage you to um, not just take it because that's what we do as a church, but Ask God to speak to you afresh and anew this morning as we prepare to take communion. Uh, usually I, I spend time in 1 Corinthians 11. As Paul says, what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you as of first importance. So I, he's like, this is, this is something that happened from the very beginning, from Christ's death with his disciples, and then on throughout the church and still today until he returns. And I love this story, though, in Luke 22, where Jesus is with his disciples, he prepares for the Passover, he sends them off to get what they need for the Passover, and if you could put yourself in the shoes of the disciple at this point, that they had been taught the scriptures since young, when they were children, and they were taught key text, definitely the covenants, definitely the sacrificial system. Yeah, from the very beginning in the, uh, with Adam and Eve, where God makes this covenant with Adam and Eve, and he covers them with animal skins, the first sacrifice. We think of Christ's righteousness covering us, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. That's what John the Baptist said when he saw Jesus. So these disciples had kind of been hearing, and they're supposed to connect the dots but of course, some of them didn't. Some of them did. I like to think that John probably did connect all the dots. That's why he was there at Jesus' crucifixion. And Jesus says to John, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. And then you had doubting Thomas, who doubted all the way until he saw the resurrected Christ. And we look at the church today, it's very similar. Some of us wake up a little older in life. Some of us maybe younger. But the Lord is patient with all of us, and all of us has that special, unique, intimate, individual journey with God. So I want you to think about that journey this morning. These disciples are there, and, and Jesus says this in chapter 22. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Beautiful words. Just beautiful words. I'm earnestly wanting to have this with you to help you connect the dots, to know what I'm about to do for you. 
so that you can be set free from your sin and live the abundant life that Jesus talked about living. My burden is light. My yoke is easy. Oh, carry your cross, right? Like, I love that and attention, like Jesus wanted his disciples to live a sacrificial life for others and pour out their life for others and not live for themselves. But, but he also says, oh, but my burden is light. My yoke is easy. So here is like culmination of that. I'm earnestly desiring because I really want you to have the burden of sin and striving to cease and that burden of sin taken off you you can know that you are reconciled to God Almighty. That is what's happening here. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, if you know him, if you've repented of your sin, you've turned to Christ, this is a chance for you to re remember what he did. It's so easy for us to forget. It's so easy for us to get focused on works again, to get caught up in a yoke of slavery again because that's how the world lives really it's like our status the things that we do are our identity how good we look and, and and as believers we're supposed to be reminded that our identity is in the work of Christ on the cross and so that's what this is all about to remember what he did and so here he is with his disciples he says I've earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. So he's focused on the kingdom of God. This is, a, this is good news it's also solemn, sobering news that he is going to suffer for his disciples. So if you get that cup out in your pew, it should be under your pew. If you get that out, take off the top bread there. And we're going to remember our Savior this morning. Just have that ready. But what I want to do before you take it, as we always do, I want to give you some time just to meditate with you and the Lord. Let him search your heart. Where are you at? Is there anything you need to just cast onto him? Anything that's burdening you that you need to let him take that? He earnestly desires to have an intimate conversation with you this morning. So let him do that. Bow your head and, and, and let the Lord speak to you before we partake of communion. as I think back on my life and connect the dots of all the things that you have done, Lord, I, I just recognize that your patient kindness, your grace has been poured out on my life over and over again to where my cup spills over and I don't deserve or am not worthy of even declaring your words but you have wrapped me in your righteousness, and I am so thankful for that. 
so that I can say with David that after the, the, the bones that have been broken and even humbled by you, Lord, that I can now rejoice and I can even teach others your ways. Lord, help us as born-again believers to take this walk in life seriously as people did throughout the last thousands of years. Think of Harriet Beecher Stowe and what the impact that communion had on her and how that changed a nation. As Abraham Lincoln even recognized that, that her book is what brought about the Civil War. Wow. And we became a free nation as a whole. People that were in slavery were freed. Lord, we just thank you. That is all because of what you have done. And we declare that this morning. We declare that you are worthy. And so as we take this, Lord, we think of your patient kindness with us personally and with your people in this world. May you be glorified in your name. Amen. So you take that bread. It says, and he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me take of that bread together. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let us drink together in remembrance of him. In our text this morning, church, is Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. This is the last uh, in our series on relationships. And then we'll be back into Romans chapter 11. And that will be in two weeks because we have a missionary coming next Sunday. It's been a while since we've had a missionary. I always love when our missionaries come and share what God's doing and how he's using our church all over the world, um, what God is doing in different parts of the world. So that'll be next Sunday, and then we'll be back into Romans. But this last one, I thought it'd be really good to address what the scriptures say about uh, our working relationships, employee, employer, and what we see in scripture on this. And so Ephesians 6, 5 through 9 is a great passage. There's so many that we could go to. Uh, Here in Ephesians, you have, of course, theology at the beginning of Ephesians, and then practical Uh, teaching for the church, and he gets into the family and the different roles of those in the family, children, parents, wives, husbands, and then into the practical everyday life of work. Now, if you've read through this book, The God Who Is There, or have been a part of our Sunday school at all, uh, the first chapter talks about how we are creating the image of God and that we create and we work as God worked and then we rest and we have that last day of the week for the Lord. Um, But we work and we create and we're created in his image. And work is a good thing and work existed before the fall. And then the fall came and work became hard and work became a, a just a problem and we had sin that makes us lazy and we want to get the most of out of it for ourselves and so here we have Ephesians after the new covenant all this brokenness throughout God's people and history of Israel and then the Messiah coming and Jesus saving the world and now the church is established and and Paul teaches the church some strong theology in Ephesians. We talked about that a little bit last Sunday. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and it's not your own doing, it's the gift of God, so that no one can boast. So then, in chapter 5, he says, Therefore, be imitators of God. And then chapter 6, getting into the family more, and then into the working environment. God likes to meddle in our lives, doesn't he? He likes to to pierce our soul and convict us and keep us 
on the straight and narrow. And so that is what this is about. This is real meddling uh, text here for us and so good. Um, I find that in our world today, people, many people, hate their work. They do not like their boss. And there is all kinds of problems in people's lives because of this, and God wants to give us wisdom. So Lord, give us your word. Give us wisdom on this topic today. And may we glorify you and be worthy of the calling that you have put in our life, that we would be imitators of you. In your name, amen. So, starting in verse 5. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not that by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with goodwill as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or is free. Masters, do the same. And stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and that there is no partiality with him. So there is no uh, PowerPoint this morning or bulletin insert. I don't have Travis, um, my wingman here that usually uh, does that. So if you want, you can write in your Bible. Uh, I like to do that. I like to have cross-references in Scripture because we're going to go through a lot of text this morning. I don't want to focus just on this one. This is like our foundation. We're going to go from here and look to the, to, to the Bible as a whole and bring that back to Ephesians. Uh, and and my, my question, and I think the reason why I ask this question is because so many do, it, why is slavery in the Bible? Why do we see slavery and why does God allow for it? It's a good question that we need to dig into. By the way, if you want to get more on that, uh, there's a good book by Paul Copan, that's C-O-P-A-N, and he writes, is God, the, the, the book is called, Is God a Moral Monster? Uh, he's a professor at Palm Beach Atlantic and um, an apologist and does an amazing job explaining the culture and the scriptures and, uh, and how people are ripping it out of context to try to attack the word of God. I've seen, especially when it comes to slavery, I've heard people many times bring this up. How can you trust the Bible the Bible had slaves, right? And so let's look at what the scriptures say about slavery because really when you look at the scriptures and you look at the Bible and the issue of slavery, it was completely different than the cultures of its time. In fact, it was a servant master type situation, not a abusive controlling kind of relationship. It was never supposed to be that. But you think during a time in the world where there was no machines, people were starving because of famine, how do people survive? Well, let me give you just a couple things that the scriptures teach on this. One, the law provided for redemption and forward progress for the slave or servant. Deuteronomy 15, 12 through 15, explains this explicitly. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you, he shall serve you six years, and in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you let him go free from you, you shall not let him go empty-handed. You shall furnish him liberally out of your flock, out of your threshing floor, and out of your wine press. As the Lord your God has blessed you, you shall give to him. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day. So, the law provided for redemption for slaves and a ongoing progress that would help them be free. Compare this with racial slavery in Egypt where people were whipped and God dealt with Egypt severely because of their slavery and how they treated God's people. 
Racial slavery was always condemned in Scripture. When we think of slavery in the last 500 years, it was racial slavery. You had the slave trade, you had kidnapping. It's completely different than what we see in the text. Second, slavery existed at times for just sheer survival. Ephesians 47 or sorry, not Ephesians, Genesis 47, 18 through 19 gives us the story of Joseph and this great famine in the land. And if you remember, God gives Joseph this vision of seven years of feast and harvest and seven years of famine. They save up during the harvest and then the famine comes and you have a lot of people in the surrounding areas that were not ready for it that got to the point where they were starving and they come to Joseph, who, is, who was a slave and works his way out of slavery and now is like Lord over the land. And this is what happens in Genesis 47, 18 through 19. And when the year was ended, they came to him and following, in the following year and said to him, we will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock Are my lords, there is nothing left in the sight of my lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food, and we with our land will be servants to Pharaoh and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. So they're in this place of just desperation. And they make this contract with Joseph that they will be committed to doing everything. Really, that's what it was. I will do everything that you say and be bound by contract. I am your slave. I will do everything you say if you will just provide for me and my family. It was a contract. And it was because of the need to survive. Remember, we have to remember the biblical narrative as well. The fall came, and so death comes to us all, and the world is broken, work is hard, life is tough, and we live in a very fallen, broken world. But God does not take away life, and he provides a way, this is 2 Samuel 14, 14, by the way, he provides a way so that the banished one will not remain an outcast. He's a God of redemption, he's a God of reconciliation, he's a God that allows people to make choices and obvious and many times get themselves into a very, very tough place. We see it in our own culture today where people are dependent upon the government and they are in a very tough place. And we see minimum wage, minimum wage. I mean, can you really survive off of minimum wage? It's meant to get you to the next place. Not supposed to necessarily stay at minimum wage. And there's always this controversy of which we raise minimum wage and we raise minimum wage and the prices go up and it does it really solve anything it's still a mess today in our system it is not a perfect system because people are a part of that system and people are broken and this has always been a problem ever since the beginning so look at the whole biblical narrative broken world because of sin and evil. We see it in the news every day. And God who redeems and brings order and brings teach law for his people to shine out his light and to treat each other with respect and to help and love each other. And so for the boss, the master, there, is, there are commands, clear commands. And for the employer, the servant, there are clear commands as well. Another thing that we need to point out is the law prohibited kidnapping and selling people. Exodus 21, 16. Here's the law. Anyone who kidnaps someone is to be put to death. So the slave trade is condemned under God's law. So when people try to use that as the Bible, oh, Christians you know, have, have been the ones that have caused slavery, it's just not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, that's why Christianity has been a part of freeing oppression, freeing people who are oppressed, ending oppression. You look all throughout history, and that has been the case. In the New Testament, the law 
protected slaves. Here we have Ephesians 6, 9. Masters, do the same to them. So, what does that mean? Render service to them in fear and trembling to your, to your servant. Stop your threatening. Know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. So, you're in an equal place. Colossians 4.1 says this, Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. So it protected the bondservant. Philemon 16, No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. Here, uh, Paul is speaking to Philemon, who is a master, and he has this slave, Onesimus, and he's encouraging him to treat him as a fellow brother in Christ. And you see, as you read through that small little book, it's just one chapter, you read through it, you see Paul's love for Onesimus and his love for Philemon and wanting this relationship to be one of mutual respect and encouragement and growth. And then we see that and we compare that to slavery in the Greek world, in the Roman Empire. It is a night and day difference, church. Night and day. Vedius Polio was a high-class Roman citizen and friend of the Emperor Augustus. This is before Christ. He is known for his extremely cruel treatment. You can even look this up on this guy of his slaves. He had a pond full of lamprey eels. I had to look that up. What was exactly is a lamprey eel? When I think eel, I think salt water. Lamprey eels are fresh water. I have them in Lake Erie, actually, and they're like something out of like an Aliens movie. They've got like this mouth that sucks with all these teeth, and they just suck the blood out of you. And he had this pond of lamprey eels, and he was known for throwing slaves in that pond who displeased him. In fact, one time a slave dropped a goblet and he was so mad, he, threw, he was having thrown in with the eels. That was what was going on in the culture of the time. Augustus had a slave crucified for killing his pet quail. When a slave had become too old or injured to work anymore, it was normal and accepted to drop them off in the wilderness to have them terminated, killed, as you would a worthless tool. So there was no equal. In fact, if you're like, I lived in Haiti when I was a kid, and one thing that my mom told me, I'll never forget this when I was a kid, she said, it's really kind of sad because the real rich people in Haiti, there's like eight families that kind of own Haiti, own all the commerce and everything. They really don't have a problem with, there's a lot of poverty because they can get workers easily, and they don't have to pay them hardly anything. It's just easy. Now, is there slavery in Haiti? No, but really there kind of is. It's like this oppression of people because you can. Juvenile in the Roman Empire tells of a slave master whose greatest delight was the sweet sound of his slaves being flogged. Wow. How can people do that? In this book that we've been reading, there's a quote that I like. It says this. It's by Daniel L. Migalor. Hopefully I said his last name right. We human beings are a mystery to ourselves. We are rational and irrational, civilized and savage, capable of deep friendship and murderous hostility, free and in bondage. The pinnacle of creation and its greatest danger. We are Rembrandt and Hitler, Mozart and Stalin, Ruth and Jezebel. What a work of art, says Shakespeare of humanity. We are very dangerous, says Arthur Miller in After the Fall. We meet not in some garden of wax fruit and painted leaves, that lies east of Eden, but after the fall, after many, many deaths. Beautiful quote. 
about people. So how can people do this? We are both created in the image of God. Also, after many deaths in the fall and sin in the heart, and that is why the raising of children is so important, parent, to raise them up, grandparent, to raise them up, to discipline them and to love them, to not provoke them, because that child has great capability of great good, and that child also can do some great evil. And so the raising of children is so important, and that is why it is so alarming, saddening, I would say even scary that in America we see just a eroding away of the family. That's why like, wearing this shirt to me is a, is a declaration of the world that what this is supposed to, like what the rainbow is supposed to be about. The family is, an, is something that God created and you don't mess up God's stuff. You don't you don't, you don't change it or redefine it. You're going to mess it up royally. People and the human mind and the human heart are very complicated. And we need to follow the designer, the creator of all. Of the family, of the child in the mother's womb. Oh, how we need the Lord. And oh, how we need to, church, shine out the light of Christ in the midst of our world today. And it is in the midst of this Roman Empire that is so broken that here you have these clear uh, uh, commands that are supposed to transform these slave, the slavery of their day into something completely different than what it was. It was a ground roots organic attack at the enemy and the brokenness of humanity. That's what it was. It wasn't go to war with Rome. It was change Rome from the inside out with your heart and how you live for Christ and you live that out in your world and it transforms your world just like Harriet Beecher Stowe did and then it transformed America. Did she go to war herself? No, that came about because hearts were starting to be transformed and people started to realize this isn't right because they were reading things like that. And they're able to see through the brokenness, see things from someone else's perspective. Notice how in Ephesians, really what he's doing is he's trying to get the, the, the employee or, or servant their mind off of themselves and onto God and onto doing the best that they can for their master. That was the goal. And the same thing for the master. It was, it was interested, God is interested in transforming from the heart rather than changing the system, transform the heart and then the system will be changed because it doesn't matter what system you have, if the heart is evil, it will be broken. It doesn't matter what political mindset you are, Republican, Democrat, capitalist, socialist, it all will be broken if the heart is dark. And so we church need to be more concerned with that than we are with politics or the system. We need to be more concerned with how we raise our kids, how we live our life in the world today, that is number one. That is to be number one amongst the believer in our heart and in our mind. Now, two things that we see clearly here when it comes to employee and employer, master, servant, is submission for the glory of the Lord, number one. Submission of the servant for the glory of the Lord. And church, people resist. We resist this. It is in our human nature to resist submission, is it not? Yet, Scripture is full of this concept. Submission is throughout Scripture. Trust in the Lord. Submit to Him, first of all, not your own ways. Even when it doesn't make sense. Even when you don't like it. In fact, even more at that time, you know, I try to tell my kids, I'm like, guys, when you do it because everything's just right and you had everything and you're going to get something from it and it makes perfect sense to do it for your own personal benefit, you don't get as much like, be, like 
respect from me that when you do it, when you really don't want to, when you really don't want to and you do it, now that shines out the light of Christ. That truly is a heart after God's own heart. So he's saying, listen, servants, don't do it for man, do it for God. Why, these, why this term fear and trembling? We're supposed to, are servants supposed to be just fearing man all the time? And are we supposed to fear man? No, no, we're supposed to fear God, right? Clearly, in, t- in the scriptures, that is the case. In fact, if you go back to Philippians 2, verse 12 to 13, Paul uses this same phrase. He says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. You see, now, let me try to disguise who this is. There was someone who was having a party in, in their garage, and, and I, I came over, and, I, and I'm, like, I'm like, just coming into the room, and right as I come into the garage, there's just F, F, and F, and F, and constantly the F word like every other word, but when I walked in, it was like everybody was just like, Ugh, I can't say that anymore. I hate that as a pastor. Why do I, why do I, I don't like it because it's like, it just makes me feel like they're just being fake around me, you know? That's what Paul is saying here. Listen, when the preacher comes, when the apostle comes in, you know, I get it. You guys all want to make it look like everything's just right. Then no, 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 no. It's not about me anyways. It's about God. And so don't do it for me. But even when I'm gone, much more in my absence, do it for the Lord. That's what he says here in Philippians, not in my presence, but much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Not work for, work out, live it out, meaning stay repentant, stay humble, stay focused on your calling, and remember who you are. That's why communion is so important. In fact, here in Philippians, Paul just got done sharing what Jesus did. That he emptied himself and he became obedient to death on a cross. So you have the son submitting to the father's plan to redeem the world. And the son submits even to death on a cross. So he's like, listen, you guys, you think about it this way. That church probably had bickering and ridiculous stuff over, I didn't get enough, or that person got more than I did, just like every church, that the families in that church had the same kind of stuff going on, and he's reminding them what Jesus did. And he's like, can you just love each other? You're not having to die on a cross. So it's a reminder, therefore, to live out your calling with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Did you know that a healthy fear of God frees you from fearing everything else? Did you know that? Like to have a healthy fear and respect of God, that you know that he is supreme, holy, like created the entire universe. When you focus on him and his sovereignty, You don't fear anything else. You don't fear cancer. You don't fear people. You don't have to live looking over your shoulder all the time because I really don't care too much about what these people think. I care about what God thinks, and that is what's most important to me. And so to fear him is to fear nothing else. And that is what Paul is doing here. Listen, with fear and trembling. So obviously he's talking about fearing God here because back in Philippians, he referred to fearing and trembling. And it wasn't about fearing Paul because Paul wasn't there. It was about fearing God. That's what it was all about. And he uses that same phrase here. And then he combines it with the fact that you are not doing this for man as eye pleasers, like trying to get everybody to look at you. I'm going to work when somebody's watching me. But when nobody's watching me, I'm going to do me. I'm going to be on my phone or whatever. When somebody's watching me, I'm going to make sure, you know, they can think that I'm a pretty good person. That, that is not how a believer in Christ is to be living. We are to live knowing that our Heavenly Father is watching us all the time. And we want to please Him. Not watching us with this angry, like, you know, you better get it right every time. But watching us with this all-loving guide, Father in Heaven, 
who is patient with us and wants to see us grow and wants to see us transform our world that is so broken. Our world that, again, we're back to, it seems often, the, 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 the secular world is all about the system, the system, the system's broken, we need to change. It's like, as believers, we should be focusing on heart transformation. Heart transformation. And that transformed heart will impact the system. So be obedient to Christ and then enjoy seeing what he does through that obedience. Because man, sometimes it's just a mother of seven kids that, that is just being obedient to start writing and look at the transformation. Maybe it doesn't affect millions, but maybe it affects the 15 or 20 people that you know well and are involved in your life and they see your good works and they see how you live and they say there's something different about that person because everybody's all about me and number one and they care about others. So may we live that way. Employee, employee, work hard as unto the Lord. Work hard as unto the Lord. Do your best Want what's best for the company, the boss that you work for. And I I do believe that God will bless it. And most of all, more importantly, God will be glorified. I think of a couple people that really stand out to me. Heidi's uncle, hardworking man, started working as a bread man, delivering bread. Got married young, didn't go to college or anything, but just worked hard. You know, you think today, it's like, it seems to me like too often the American dream is you got to have a college degree and you got to become like some big doctor or something. And there's certain like careers that are respected and there are other careers that are not. Not so with the kingdom of God. Not so with the kingdom of God. God's after your heart and how you work, how you love people, how you work for his glory first and foremost Heidi's uncle worked hard for this company and moved up. It just kept moving up. And, and I remember having a conversation with him maybe 15 years ago where, where he, he said, you know, there's guys always complaining at work that they don't get paid enough. They just never get paid enough. They're never happy. They're never content. There's always a problem. This, the, the, the boss is always against them. The company is always against them. And, and he said, I, I often will ask them a question. I'll say, did... Uh, did you agree to work for a certain amount per hour when you came in? And, and, and they'll say, yeah. Are you getting paid what you agreed to? Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. I just love that perspective. And it was that kind of perspective that caused him to move up. And now that guy makes more than I'll probably ever make in life. And it was because of a hard work ethic with the right attitude that just did what was right. And not that he was doing it for that. I believe he was doing it because he's a believer in Christ. He was doing it because of God. Because at the end of the day, it's all about his glory. Now, I think of my buddy from out west, same type of thing. Worked hard, moved up, boss over others, cared for his company. And he really cared for his company. He had like, it was, it had stocks in his company. He wanted his company to succeed. And so people would steal from his store and he would stop them. He would, he would stop them like every time. I'll never forget one time he told me. He's like, there was, there was this one store that he worked for because he switched stores, moving from assistant manager and on up. And there's this one store. They just constantly have these guys stealing from their store all the time. Run in, grab some alcohol, run out. He would just get so tired of it. So he said, and, and the, it was kind of a rougher area. <laughs> I think his boss was like fine with this. He would like, tackle these guys at times one time he threw an apple and nailed the guy in the back of the head and the guy just fell over and he got her grabbed him and held him until the police came now i'm not saying that that's what you should do okay but i love that he like this why did he do that because he really cared about his company and i saw that in him as i got to know him more and more and he would just tell me stories and things that would happen and we would kind of laugh over it but i'm like you know what, he cared about his company. Well, he didn't just care about getting a paycheck for himself. If you just care about a paycheck for yourself, you don't care if the company gets robbed a thousand times. It doesn't matter. Now, 
Another good friend of mine here in Decatur raves about his boss and how his boss cares for his employees. And his boss really pays his employees well and cares about his employees. He said, when I, when I become a boss, I want, I want to be just like that. I want, to, I want to do that to my employees. Which leads us to the last point here. Bosses, be a Christ-like boss. Notice how he says, do the same to them. Do the same. How do you do the same? Well, you render them a good service. What is the good service that you render them? You pay them well. You care about their needs. So you do the same to them out of fear and trembling to God because God is your master and you will answer to him someday in how you treated your employees. Did you know that? Isaiah 58, 1 through 3. Just want to read these three verses in in closing. This is like a call for Israel to repent. They were doing all the right things. They were religiously fasting, praying, doing all those things, and yet oppressing their workers. And God did not even hear their prayers because of how they treated their workers. It says this in chapter 58, 1 through 3, Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why have we fasted? And you see it not, they say. Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Here's God. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Wow. If you are in the position where you have people working under you, be a boss that they just love working for. Care about their needs. My buddy from out west, he's a brilliant, he's a strong kind of guy, throws the apple. A little, little off the radar there, right? You think, man, that guy must be mean. No, you know what? He actually had such a good relationship with his employees that one of the guys called him his father. And then after he went off to Iraq, went in service, five years gone, comes back, and he's getting married, and he, and he, he wants him to be in his wedding because he just had such a good good impact on him. Because he's like, that guy cares about, think about that, do you have a boss? If you're a boss, are you the kind of boss that your employee would want you to be in their wedding? I wanna encourage you, if you want something to read this week, read Isaiah 58, just the whole chapter. It's a beautiful chapter, and it shows how God is a God of fairness, He cares for those who are oppressed and he wants his people to be those who are good to others and set the oppressed free. Let us close in prayer. Father, uh, today we even have unions and all kinds of ways to keep people from being oppressed. And yet even with those, we have strikes and lockouts and We have the employee wanting more money and less work, and we have the employer wanting more work and less money handed out and more profit, and Lord, we are a greedy, selfish people. Lord, it is in us, it is in our blood, it is in the land that is broken. Oh, Father, help us to be the salt, the light. Help us to... Do our very best as unto you. Lord, we may be able to get away with something. We may be able to work the system in a way that it benefits us. Oh, but Father, help us to know that you are always watching us. And that you watch us as a loving Father. Lord, help us to be careful. The little hands, what we do the eyes that we see, the places that we go, for our Father up and above is looking down in love. And oh, how we want to live for you, our Heavenly Father. In your name, amen.